Hello, my name is Dr. Liz Tosh and I am working at Sonoma State University in the wine business department and my title here is actually Distinguished Professor of Wine and I am doing this presentation for my friend Dr. Roy Thornton and his students at California State University in Fresno and I thank you very much for asking me to do this and it's possible maybe this will be useful for a few other people as well. Anyway, Roy asked me to talk about the uh, Master of Wine program uh, and tell you a little bit about it. And so what I thought I would do is cover uh, four different topics today. Um, the first is sort of the mission and the history of the Institute of Masters of Wine. And then a lot of people have a question about what is the difference between an MW and an MS. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll tell you how the program works, and then I'll tell you my journey. It actually took me five years to become a Master of Wine, and I hate to tell you, but that's actually rather short. So anyway, uh, a little bit about the, uh, the MW. It was actually established in 1953 in uh, London, England, and the mission of the Institute is through its membership and its activities is to promote professionalism and excellence and global understanding in all sectors of the international wine trade. So it's truly a global program and we have members in many countries around the world. Um, and so since 1953 we've actually had a total of 391 people pass the exam um, but today uh, there are only 340 MWs in the world, but we are in 24 different countries. And the MW exam is considered to be the most rigorous wine exam in the world. And I can attest to that because I would have to say that the MW was much more difficult than getting a PhD. I know that's probably hard to believe, but once I explain to you what it's like, uh, you'll see why. So another way of looking at the MW, it's sort of like becoming a Navy SEAL of wine. So I'm going to dare you at the end of this presentation to consider joining, because we do have a lot of uh, winemakers who study for the MW. So I want to start with a picture. And this is a picture of Vintners Hall in London, England. This beautiful old building was originally established in 1363. It's right on the Thames River in London, but it was rebuilt in 1670. And we call this the spiritual home to the UK wine trade. And it's the location of the MW ceremonies. Um, so once you become an MW, you are invited to this beautiful building and you go through this amazing ceremony. I guess it's almost like being knighted or something like that. It's called the MW Induction Ceremony in London. And uh, this is the group that um, passed when I was there. So every year you have anywhere from three to maybe 10 uh, people who become MWs around the world. And uh, you can see me off to the right there getting my, my diploma. It's a, it hangs right next to my PhD diploma at home. It was that hard. Um, but anyway, some of you might be saying, like I was in the beginning, why London? What does London have to do with wine? Well, what many people don't know is that it was actually the British who sort of started the wine trade because they started trading uh, wine, well, professional wine trade, I'd say, wine in Bordeaux in, Bordeaux in the 1100s. Um, and so because of this, uh, the British are considered to be the largest and oldest wine traders in the world. Um, so of course from Bordeaux, they move south to Spain and Portugal. You know, Shakespeare talks about the wines of Madeira from the 1400s. And so through the centuries, the British have really, really developed excellent palates and knowledge in wine. And so because of this, they, through their old um, system of, of, of studying for um, masters, masters of, a, of, a, of a, a trade, for example, set up the Masters of Wine program. And they wanted to be able to ensure that they had people who were experts at tasting and buying wines from all over the world. So, but in the meantime, England actually now today does have 135 wineries and they're known for really excellent and expensive sparkling wines. Part of this might be because they have a very similar climate to Champagne and they even have the chalky soil that Champagne has. But what a lot of people don't know is that the Romans, when the Romans were in England, actually did establish vineyards and wineries in that time as well. 
So what is a master of wine? Well, we sort of have a definition that has four components. One is that once you become an MW, you're considered to be an internationally recognized expert in the art, science, and business of wine. So it's not just one area, it's all three. And you really are an ambassador for the wine trade. And one of the things we like to say, an MW learns to taste like a detective and argue like a barrister. And if you're not up on your British terms, a barrister is a lawyer. Because one of the things you have to be able to do is taste distinctly each thing that's in the glass and then argue why you think it is what it is. And I promise you, you're going to be wrong many times. And that's part of the journey, is learning humility to become an MW. And then finally, being a problem solver with excellent communication skills. So who are the MWs? Well, here's just a few of my friends. Um, Robert Polinski, he's the VP at BevMo. So we have a lot of people on the trade side. But we also have winemakers. Another good friend of mine is Bob Betts. He's a winemaker who lives in Washington and makes award-winning Washington's raw wines. And then there's Jancis Robinson. You've probably known her. She's written lots and lots of books. She's an author and lives in London, and I've had the honor of judging with her. Then there's Nicholas Paris. He's a brand new MW, and he works for Gallo as the director of their education in New York. So we have MWs who work at large and small wineries. And then there's Amy Christine. She's another friend, and she's a buyer at Kermit Lynch which you probably heard of, a nice small uh, boutique importer. And then we have Igor, who was one of my mentors, and he's the director of the very large LCBO in Canada. Can you imagine being in charge of buying almost all of the wine for a country? That's Igor. So there's a lot of really amazing MWs, and they're in all aspects of the industry. Some are winemakers, some are writers, some are educators, and a lot of them work in the trade. So, what are the benefits of being an MW? Now that I'm one, I would have to say probably the best benefit is just this unparalleled network of wine contacts I have all over the world. I can pick up a phone and pretty much talk to anybody in wine, get uh, an invitation to any winery in the world, and talk to some key people. It's wonderful. I have a mentor network that if I need help with anything, it's there. And I can just reach out to these people. Um, you make friends for life. And um, to me, that's probably the biggest benefit. But there are many others as well. One is, having survived the most rigorous wine exam in the world makes you feel pretty good. Of course, you get beat up a lot along the way, which I'll tell you about in a short time. Um, so it's not easy. But um, it's really nice to have finally passed and receiving an incredible wine education. They really, you learn everything there is about wine, and you learn about every corner of the world. Um, and you learn humility, because everybody who becomes an MW has been beat up, has been public humiliated, has had to s say out loud that they were wrong about a wine or about an opinion, and so we learn humility. And I think that's a great lesson to learn. Um, and then finally, Usually, once you become an MW, you, you, you get a promotion, you get a lot of job advancements. I know I did at Sonoma State. They made me the first distinguished professor of wine once I became an MW. Um, and lots of consulting opportunities. And one of the nice perks of being a professor is I am encouraged to consult for the university. And so this is nice for me to have this as well. So lots of benefits. So um, another question I often have, though, is what is the difference between an MW and an MS? Um, and I actually have one of my students uh, at Sonoma State who has become an MS, and I'm really proud of him, Ian Cobble. And it took him about the same amount of time as it took me to become an MW. And because of this, I believe that both exams are equally difficult. They're quite different, but they are equally difficult and rigorous. And I have a lot of friends who are MSs as well as MWs, and even a couple. There's only four people in the world who are actually both. And I'm proud to say that two of them are close friends of mine, Eric Hemer in Florida, who works for Southern Wine and Spirits, and also Doug Frost, who's a world-famous consultant and buys all the wines for United Airlines. Um, but anyway, let's just talk briefly about the differences. Both organizations are based in London. Uh, the MW is, of course, with the Institute of Masters of Wine, started in 1953. We have 340 MWs today. And the MS is with the Court of Masters Sommeliers, established 1969, just a few years later, and so 230 MSs. 
So if we look at what the MS focuses on, they are focusing on fine wine and beverage service. And so not just wine, but they also do spirits and beer, and they do cigars too. So you have to know a sort of a broader range uh, to be an MS. Um, and really, and the other key thing about an MS, and this is why I couldn't be one, is because you have to have restaurant experience as a psalm. And if you've seen the movie Psalm, you see a little bit about what, what that's all about. Um, but also, just like the MW, the MS has four levels that you need to go through. So the first F is uh, level of one is the MS introductory class. Then there's level two, which is certified psalm. Uh, and then level three is advanced, uh, and then level four is where you get to become an MS. Uh, and you actually, like the MW, have to be invited. You have to have um, people who um, sponsor you and support you and write letters of recommendation for you. Um, now the other big difference is the MS exam is oral, and they also have to demonstrate how they are the beverage service. Um, and theirs is usually all done in one day. Um, so whereas the MW is done in four days. So let's move over to the other side and look at the MW. So we are, uh, our, some people say our exam is more academic, but to me it seems pretty practical. Um, you have to know a lot about viticulture, enology, business, and social issues of wine. Um, and it requires three years of wine industry experience. So you have to have worked in the wine industry three solid years before you can even consider applying. And then you need to have completed, just like the MS, uh, four levels. So first level, WSET level two, WSET level three, WSET diploma, and a master of wine. Now there are some exceptions where they will accept other higher level certifications, such as Society of Wine Educator, and also some of the MS levels. So um, but you just have to work that out with your sponsor when they're writing your letter of recommendation. Um, but the other big difference is the exam is written. So one of the things about the MW is I tell people if you don't like to write, it's probably not the right exam for you because you really need to be, if you're not a good writer, you need to become one. Um, and it's a s distinct style of writing that you need to learn. But they teach you how to write that way, so that's helpful. So let's talk now about how the program works. So. First of all, you have to get accepted, and this is challenging. Um, every year I usually make write recommendations for three or four people, and every year only one of those people gets accepted. So it's hard to get accepted. Um, to get accepted, you have to actually write an essay, you have to do a tasting uh, exam, you have to have your application and your letters of reference. And you apply usually in the summer, and you find out in September if you've been accepted. If you didn't get accepted, well, then you do the whole thing again next year until you do get accepted. I would have to say the one word that comes to mind for the MW is perseverance. If you're the kind of person that gives up easily, then don't even start. This is something that you're in for the long haul. It's like strategy. You have to have a long-term vision. So once you get in, Stage one is you go to a week-long seminar, and you have your choice. You can take the seminar in, well, Napa or Sonoma area, somewhere in Europe, uh, or in Australia. And so every year, this uh, seminar is offered in these three locations. So one year you can go to one, and the next year you can go to a different one if you'd like. Um, then there's also two one-day seminars, and you can do those in different places around the world. There's always one in California to make it easy for California wine lovers. Um, you also get a personal mentor and a whole bunch of writing and tasting assignments. And you'll be turning those in and those are going to be graded. But it's very much a personal study program. Um, you have to go out and hit the books and websites and do interviews and talk to people. It's based on the British system of self-study. It's based uh, pretty much on, I went to Oxford for a semester, so I know how this works. You, you get a mentor or you get a tutor at Oxford. They give you an assignment. You meet with them for one hour a week, and then you go work on the assignment and write a big paper the rest of the week, and then bring that back, and then they give you feedback on it often pretty brutal feedback. So I was used to that system. It's not like the American system, which is warm and fuzzy, where teachers are nice to you and supportive. This is more of a beat you up a little bit, tough love, kind of sink or swim kind of program. Um, so it's important to know that up front. Otherwise, you can be a little shocked by um, maybe the lack of support you think you're getting. But it's all because it's 
uh, requires your self-discipline, your self-motivation. You need to ask for what you want. You need to contact your mentor. They're not going to contact you. So at the end of that first year, you have to, you're required to sit the first year exam. It is in June, and it is one day in length. And in the morning, you taste 12 wines blind. In the afternoon, you write three essays. Now, if you pass, you go on to stage two. If you don't pass, you either, one, get kicked out of the program, or two, you go back and repeat year one again. So I have uh, several friends this year who were kicked out and who had to go back and repeat year one, and several who got out to go on to stage two. This happens every year. It's just part of the perseverance. So stage two. Again, you pretty much repeat everything you did the first year. You go again to the week-long seminar. You do two-one-day day, two, one day seminars. You, again, have a personal mentor and lots of tasting assignments. And this year, you need to become really, really serious about your tasting group. You need to find a group of people to taste with every week. I had a group of uh, four of us, and we called ourselves the Death Squad. We said if we were going to do or die, we were going to pass this exam. We met every Saturday morning and we tasted 12 wines blind um, and got frustrated a lot and upset and we cried and we screamed and we yelled and we complained but eventually out of the four of us three of us passed the exam so the exam then is uh, the actual real MW exam is four days long it's only offered once a year and it's in June and just to let you know the very first time you sit the exam there's a 90 percent failure rate in terms of passing the whole thing. It's very rare to pass the whole thing the first time you sit. In fact, I only know three people who've ever done that. I know there must be more, but I only know three who have. Um, so usually what happens is you maybe pass half or maybe you pass absolutely nothing, which is more common, and you go back and have to do it again. So you can stay in stage two for several years because you um, can't get out of stage two until you pass the exam. And if you don't pass the exam in three years, you get kicked out. So um, anyway, it's motivating, it's fun, it's challenging, it's tough, um, sort of like the Marines, you know, a few good people. Um, so once you pass the exam, then you go into stage three, which is where you write a research paper. This usually takes another year, six months to a year. Um, and then um, that's, um, sometimes it gets kicked back and you have to do it again. You have to make revisions. I've known people who has been kicked back for three different times. Mine was kicked back once to make some minor revisions, uh, but eventually I passed. So it finally took, it took me a total of five years um, to get through. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But I have some friends that took them longer, like seven, eight, even one person, 10 years. And that was when they still let you stay in forever and they change the rules and you, they won't let people stay in forever anymore. So anyway, then you get admitted and you get to really, really celebrate. I promise you, once you become an MW, you celebrate. And your family celebrates. My husband was so happy. So was my daughter. So um, let's talk a little bit about the four-day exam then. So what happens on the very first day of the exam is in the morning you taste 12 white wines blind. And we call this the practical portion of the exam. So this practical in the morning and theory in the afternoon. Um, of the 12 white wines, uh, usually um, only about 5% of the wines on the exam are from the US. 95% are from many other countries. A lot of them are from Europe. So you really, really need to know your old world countries. And I'll explain what you need to know in a few minutes. Then in the afternoon, you have three essays on viticulture. And I'll show you an example of those questions in just a minute. So then you go home and you try to sleep. And you wake up the next day and you come back and do it all again. But this time it's 12 red wines blind in the morning. And everybody says the red wine is the most difficult part to pass. Um, and then three essays on uh, vinification and pre-bottling procedures, so pretty much enology the second day. Um, then the third day, you have, we call it the mixed bag, but usually it's a mix of sparkling and dessert wines, and sometimes you might throw in a rosé or pretty much anything they want, so you're not sure what it's going to be. Um, but you really need to know your dessert wines for this piece, 
And we're not just talking port and champagne. We're talking really unusual dessert wines. We're talking Tokai. We're talking Sherry. We're talking Madeira. We're talking Rutherford Glen. We're talking lots of different unusual wines from around the world. Um, and then that afternoon, you have three essays on the handling of wine. This is a lot of things like shipping wine around the world in, in bulk containers and quality control, QCQA, and uh, things like that. Um, and then day four, no wine tasting, thank goodness, uh, or maybe not, uh, but you have five essays. In the morning, you have three on the business of wine. In the afternoon, you have two on contemporary wine issues. And usually at the end of that day, they do break out a really nice bottle of champagne. Uh, so you know you're done. So that happens in June, but you don't find out your results for the first week of September. So pretty much you sit on pins and needles all summer long, or you just put your books away and go rest and relax and maybe drink a beer for a week and then go back to wine. Um, you do only have three attempts um, to take the exam. As I mentioned, if you don't pass any parts of it, um, you either have to pass all of the practical or all of the theory in one sitting. If you don't pass uh, all of that, then you, have, then you um, get kicked out. You have to sit out for three years before you can uh, go back in again. And I know a lot of people who've done that. And I am I have the utmost respect for them because people who've tried it for three years, don't pass, sit out for three years, and come back, those are the kind of people that show the perseverance to become an MW. Um, so if you do pass, say, theory, which is what I did, I passed the theory portion the very first year. I was incredibly lucky. Um, and that's probably because I love to write. I'm a writer, I publish lots of books, so writing comes easy to me. I passed the theory course in the first year, uh, but it took me two more attempts, two more years, before I passed the tasting part, because that was more challenging for me. And then I had to write my uh, research paper, and so it took five years. So, um, let me give you an example of some of the questions. Um, these are not the easiest questions in the world, and you have to answer them in a very specific kind of way that they teach you once you get accepted into the program. So for the practical questions, which are the wine tasting part, for every wine you are tasting blind, you must be able to name the varietal, the region, and when we're in Burgundy, we have to name it down to the village level, and we even have to say whether it's a Grand Cru or a Prima Cru vineyard. Uh, we have to talk about how it was made based on what we see in the glass. We even have to be able to say what kind of oak it was made of. We have to say how long it was aged in the oak. We have to be able to say fermentation temperature based on what we're tasting and seeing in the class. We have to talk about the quality level of the wine, the suggested price for the wine, the vintage, the alcohol level, the sugar, the acids, and many other things. Um, so you have to be able to deduce this from what you see, smell, and taste in the glass. So that's why they say you need to taste like a detective and then argue like a barrister. So I'm giving you a couple questions. For example, they might give you a flight of four wines and say, identify the grape varietal, or all four are the same. Identify the region, they might all be from different regions or from four different populations uh, with the, within Burgundy or Bordeaux. Uh, describe winemaking using elements in the glass. So that might be an example of questions you'd have on four sets of wines and you'd have to answer those questions for all four wines. Now when we move to theory, it gets, I think, even more challenging because the questions are really very quite specific, meaning you need to know a range of many, many different things. And you have to have examples, at least three examples from all over the world for each question. Um, and each question is one essay. Uh, and the, each essay is one hour in length. And there's a couple that are longer. Um, but for example, the first question I have here is for the viticulture um, theory uh, paper or papers. So what are the causes of grapevine trunk diseases such as ESCA and what are the best strategies to combat them? So you have to write an essay for one hour on that and have examples from all over the world. Um, an example from the uh, vinification. Uh, what contributions do yeast make to wine and how far can a winemaker control these? Again, do you have to describe yeast, give examples from around the world. Uh, another uh, question from um, uh, paper three is assess the various methods of transporting wine in bulk and what precautions should be taken from a QA uh, perspective. 
Um, again, you need to know about shipping containers uh, around the world for wine and have examples from all over the world and have all the statistics at hand. Um, for the wine business paper, here's an example. As the brand manager of a 500,000 case wine brand, what five key statistics would you most closely monitor to gauge the performance of your brand and why? So again, you're going to need to understand branding, be able to define that, and have clear examples from around the world with statistics. And then from the um, current issues um, paper, which is the last day, um, day four, paper five we call it, um, is an example would be, is the natural wine movement losing momentum? What is its future? You know, and the nice thing is the Institute of Masters of Wine puts these example questions from all the exams dating back for the last, I think, 15 or 20 years. They're out there on the um, website. So you can actually download and study these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions and um, try to help um, prepare yourself for the exam. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience. I would say it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. There were times when I was ecstatic and there were times when I was in deep pain and deep doubt that I could continue because it, it can be that difficult. There's a lot of times you feel like getting up and I have to, when I mentor people, once you become an MW, you have to mentor, I have to remind my mentees of that, the ones who are ready to quit, the ones who are ready to throw in the towel because it can be very frustrating because this is a, a system where you don't necessarily get feedback on what you did wrong. And so you just know you flunked the paper. They'll say you got a, a D, but you won't know why. Um, and so it's very challenging because you have to just go back, pick yourself up, and dust yourself up and start all over again. So it's important to have a nice network, a support system around you. So I actually I had uh, started working at Sonoma State in 2000. And in 2005, I published my first uh, wine book. And it was at my wine... Um, my first wine book um, signing that I was approached by two really good MW friends and they suggested since I knew how to write that I become a uh, study for the MW program and I said oh absolutely not there's no way I, I could I could never ever be an MW and they said why not and I said well because I, I only have a California palate I, I don't have a palate of the wines of the world and they said well we can teach you and you can travel and so um, I applied and I got in and um, that began my five-year odyssey and uh, so I uh, studied really hard and two years later took the exam for the first time and miraculously passed theory and then of course it was very frustrating to go for two more years before I was finally able to pass tasting. Um, I did travel a lot, I took sabbaticals, I went to France for a month, I went to Australia for a month um, to really learn the wines in depth and then I travel to uh, lots of other places. There's scholarships to help you pay for it. It's actually really not that expensive when you look at other programs um, out there and the only part that's expensive is buying the wines. And so that's why you want to get in a tasting group where you share the price of the wines and then that makes it affordable. Um, some people are lucky enough that their companies will pay for part of the education. But um, once you're done, there's nothing that feels better. And you get to um, become a member of the Institute of Masters of Wine, which is a nonprofit group. And as nonprofits, we give back. We give back our time and we mentor people. And there's nothing more joyous than being a mentor and then helping others in their wine journey. And you also get to go to some really fabulous places all over the world. Because another benefit I forgot to mention is every year the Institute puts on these great trips around the world, which are highly subsidized. And so I've been able to go on trips to like South Africa, or I got to taste at some of the great, great um, wineries of the world down there. I got to taste uh, verticals of the top Bordeaux. Um, I got to taste verticals of the top Burgundies. Um, Germany, I mean, everything, you name it. Uh, so now I have been to over 35 different countries, tasting wine in all of them, including Vietnam most recently, China several times, and I would have to say it's just the beginning of an incredible journey. So I said I would dare you at the end of this presentation, so I am putting out my dare to you. Consider signing up for the MW in the future when you're ready.
Thank you so much and have a great day.